Sneasel was given a very rough time of it by Game Freak in Generations 2 and 3. Sneasel has an absolutely ludicrous physical attack, but both of its typings are special attackers. That means we're going to have to use our strong physical attacks throughout the run and only use our stab moves when absolutely necessary. And as always, before we get into this round, we have the normal YouTube shenanigans to get into. If you enjoy this round, please do think about leaving it a like. If you want to see more runs just like this, then please do click the subscribe button. I have a Patreon at patreon.com slash trainersquidgy, and you can join the HM friends in the channel link down below. Now, I've got a little question for you today. And now, I've got a little question for you all today. How would you have improved Sneasel in Generations 2 and 3? In Generation 4, of course, the physical special split happens, so Sneasel got a huge improvement along with an evolution. So what can we do in the interim to make Sneasel better? I'll let you ponder over that as we take a look at our stats. We are of course starting at level 5 and we have 21 HP. We're holding a berry and our moves are Scratch and Leer. We've got 15 in attack, 11 in defense, 10 in special attack, 14 in special defense, and 18 in speed. And if you want to keep an eye on the stats in real time, keep a lookout on the bottom right hand corner of the screen. Those stats will update in real time, but for now I'm going to show you the very first encounter we had. It was a level 2 female Rattata and two scratches knocked it out. Now just before we get into Mr. Pokemon's house, we're going to do a little bit of grinding and take advantage of our medium slow experience group. The medium slow experience group group is a bit of an oxymoron. At the beginning of the game, where experience arguably matters the most, the medium fast experience group is the second fastest to level up. It's only behind the fast experience group, and we'll actually be seeing some Pokemon from the fast experience group in the not too distant future. In March I recorded Gramble and Ipom's runs, and I am just waiting for the perfect time to release them, so do keep an eye out. In the meantime, we'll take on the first rival battle, and this time I gave him a Cyndaquil. It was an obvious choice, really. We are weak to fire-type moves, so that was the clear-cut choice. Now let's take a little trip back to the Pokemon Laboratory, where the police officer is wondering what that rival's name is. Now the rival identified himself as Triple Question Mark, and we are no snitch here on this channel, so we're going to play along with him and call him what he wanted to be named. In the meantime though, we're going to make our way up towards Violet City, where our first gym leader is waiting for us. This is the first of 16 gyms we're going to be taking on and seeing throughout the run. This is Falconer, he is a flying-type leader who leads with Pidgey. It would be great if we had an ice-type move at this point, but we learn no ice-type moves by level up, so instead we're just going to have to quick attack. A pair of quick attacks on both Pokemon knock them out, and we get Falconer's badge in a time of 5 minutes and 55 seconds. So it's all the fives for that badge, but we have to very quickly move on towards Route 32 and the Union Cave. On our way south, we'll pick up that very important Paralyzed Cure Berry, and then we'll make our way into the cave. We pick up the Swift TM on the floor below, and now we're going to take on Fire Breather Ray. He's got a Vulpix, which is no match for our high special defense. We grow to level 17, and we learn Screech. But now it's time to catch our all-important HM friends in the Ilex Forest. And first up today is Paris. On Team Paris, amongst many other people, we have Metal Hammer, Paul Anthony, we have Andrew the Sandshrew, Peachley Frenchy, Vetzler C. Duke, Mudo, Gemma Barnes, and Retro Nubs. And hot on the heels of Paris is Psyduck. On Team Psyduck, amongst many other people, we have Dylan Davis, I Prisms, Jacob Melton, Adrian Riojas, SK, and Hayabusa. And with the HM friends safely tucked away in our bag, we can make our way into the gym, and en route we're going to teach both Mudslap and Swift. Mudslap isn't the greatest move, but it's our only move that will be able to hit Rival 2's Ghastly, and Swift is just a vast improvement on our current normal type moves, and the fact it never misses is just a nice little bonus. But now let's engage Bugsy in conversation, he is our second gym leader together, he's a bug type specialist who leads with Metapod. We two shot the Metapod with Swift and we are already on to the cocoon. Cocoon is a critical hit one shot and we are on to the most dangerous of his three Pokemon. Scyther's Fury Cutter is super effective but it's no match for us, we knock it out and we have defeated Bugsy in a time of 13 minutes and 59 seconds. Of course we can't celebrate for too long though, our next rival battle is just around the corner. Quite literally in this case he's going to engage us in battle and it's lucky we taught Mudslap already. So let's now get to work on Mudslapping his Pokemon. Ghastly goes down in one shot and here comes Quilava. Another Mudslap takes it into the yellow and then a third Mudslap knocks it out once and for all. 
In hindsight, a move like Swift would probably have been better against the Quilava. However, as you may have noticed, I don't have dynamically updating power and accuracy on my overlay. This has been a conscious choice for me ever since I started doing these challenge runs. I have my own specific playstyle where I don't over-optimise and I don't over-prepare. I like seeing how good a Pokemon is on gut instinct alone. And of course, we then have the redo streams to optimise later on to see just how quicker it could have been. But enough waffling, we are now on to our third HM friend. This one is Abra. And on Team Abra, we have William Osborne, Dom Verrill, Pariah Dark, Sombrero Faro, and we also have Nate Boyd, Calm Bay, Baby T, and Connor Walton. And now let's pick up the bikes so that we can move at even faster speed around the Johto and Kanto regions, and we'll teach Headbutt over Quick Attack. As lovely as it would be to have a priority move, having a 70 base power move along with a 30% chance of flinching is something not to be sniffed at. We'll now pick up TM28 from the National Park, we'll have a little chat with Floria and we'll pick up Kenya. And on Team Kenya, we have Francesco, Floor Inspects, Dr. Chops, Nichols, Jack Harris, Travis Blakenship, and Wolf, amongst many other people. But now it's time for our third of 16 gyms. This is Whitney, the normal type specialist who leads with Clefairy. She sends that Clefairy out and we headbutt it and it flinches. Two shots on the Clefairy and here comes the Miltank. The Miltank has a super effective rollout but we manage to flinch it. That means that rollout doesn't build and we defeat her on our first attempt. We get the plane badge in a time of 20 minutes and 5 seconds. And that means our first run through of Goldenrod City is complete. We'll get the Squirts bottle off Floria's sister and we'll make our way north towards Ecratic City. En route we shall annoy a tree and we'll also pick up the Rock Smash TM just in case we need it a little bit later on. And then we'll make our way into Ecratic City proper. The first destination is going to be the Kimono Girls Dance Theatre. This is where we're going to grab the Surf HM. But first, we've got to beat up five evolutions, and even with the one that was super effective against us, we had no issues at all. Our reward, of course, is the Surf HM, which we'll teach after getting strength as well, but for now we're going to take a trip east towards the Lake of Rage. We're going to pick up the Rare Candy, and we're also going to get Hidden Power. Now, our Hidden Power type this time was a very easy choice. We are four times weak to fighting, so we are going to go for Hidden Power Flying. The only other type that fighting is weak to, of course, is Psychic, and we have absolutely no special attack, so it makes no sense. We're now going to go west and towards Olivine City, where we'll grab Strength and teach that along with Surf to Psyduck, before ascending the Lighthouse. At the tippy top of the Lighthouse, Jasmine is conveniently waiting for us. She claims to have a sick Ampharos and needs some medication from over the water, but I'm still very suspicious of her. We'll have to wait and see though, because before we cross the open seas, we've got to make our way back towards our third rival battle. This one's in the Burnt Tower and he will lead with an evolved Haunter. This is why we got all those levels up to try and make Mudslap do as much as possible. We still got cursed unfortunately, but we are already onto the Quilava. We kick mud into Quilava's eyes to make sure it's Ember misses and then we headbutt it to knock it out once and for all. Magnemite's a mud slap to go down and the final Pokemon is Zubat. One shot with headbutt knocks it out and we've defeated the rival. We'll fall through the floor and we will release the beasts. Those three beasts are going to be roaming the Johto region now and hopefully we won't encounter them. In the meantime though, we're going to say goodbye to Screech and we're going to say hello to Hidden Power Flying. Hidden Power Flying is something that can hit the ghost type Pokemon in Morty's gym, so it's just as well we have it on our learn set. Mudslap is a great move against the Magnemite line, but it's absolutely terrible against most other Pokemon. We're much better off using Hidden Power against all of these ghastly line Pokemon. One shot on the first two Pokemon, he sends out the level 21 Haunter next. It's a one shot on that, and that just leaves Gengar left to go. Gengar looks at us funny and traps us, but that just means we knock it out quicker. And we've defeated Morty in a time of 29 minutes and 54 seconds. Let's now head back towards Olivine City so that we can cross the open seas, but not before getting the sharp beak off Monica of Monday. That will increase our flying type attacks by 10%, and now that we're in Sionwood City, we're going to get the secret potion from the man in the dodgy shop. We've been saying it for absolutely months here on this channel, but that man is suspicious. We mustn't linger on him, though, because we have Chuck to take on. He's our fifth gym leader together, he's a fighting type specialist, and already his primate has gone bye-bye. And it's goodbye to the Polyrath as well in two shots as Dynamic Punch has missed. And that means we're through what could have been our toughest gym battle on our very first try in a time of 32 minutes and 2 seconds. 
We can now make our way back towards the Lake of Rage after obtaining Fly from Chuck's wife, where we have a red Gyarados waiting for us. This red Gyarados unlocks the Mahogany Underground, where absolutely nothing will happen, except we'll get the Whirlpool HM. But first, we've got to knock it out, and we had a little bit of trouble knocking it out very quickly. Three shots did the trick, though, and now we can chat with Lance the Liar. At the end of the underground section, he'll give us the Whirlpool HM. We'll be teaching that to Psyduck along with Waterfall a little bit later on. But for now, we'll go straight into the gym. This is where Price, the Ice-type specialist, a little bit like us in this instance, is waiting for us. He's gym number six, and he leads with Seal. If we had more PP here, our plan would have been to headbutt everything. But, in theory, it should be much quicker to just use Swift. With there only being 10 base power difference between Headbutt and Swift, it just makes more sense to use up the PP you have and skip a heal in the Pokemon Center. And in this instance, it worked out perfectly for us. We knock out the Pilot Swine on our first attempt, still in the yellow HP, and we obtain the Glacier Badge in a time of 37 minutes and 42 seconds. And now, with six badges acquired, we'll do a little bit of cleaning up around the Johto region, picking up items that we might need in the future. We'll go into the Slowpoke Well first of all and pick up the King's Rock. That will allow us to flinch with an awful lot of our physical attacking moves. It's another trip back to Goldenrod City, where we're going to go into the Pokemart. We'll pick up TM27, which contains Return, and we'll also pick up a couple of TMs. We'll get two Ice Punches, and we'll also get two Spare Headbutts. The reason for that is we are going to be saying goodbye to Headbutts right about now. We're going to teach Dynamic Punch over Headbutt, and this is what we're going to be trying to use against Jasmine Steelix. However, before we get to Jasmine, we're going to pick up the Rare Candy south of the daycare, and we're also going to battle the Cool Trainer Sisters in their secret hideout. Not only is this a good litmus test for how Sneasel's going to do going forwards, with Shelter and Cloyster having incredibly high physical defense, you also get a very good reward after defeating these ladies. We will get the Soft Sand off them. Now, the Soft Sand will give us a 10% boost to our ground-type moves, and that is especially important because we are going up to the top of the lighthouse and we are giving Jasmine that secret potion. She's going to claim to give that secret potion to Amphi, but we're going to set off hot on her heels to find out if she's been secretly giving it to Steelix. Now, the reason the Soft Sand is so important before this gym is because she is a Steel-type leader who will lead with Magnemite. Even though Magnemite has a quad weakness to Mud Slap, it's still such a terrible move that they can sometimes survive. But we're onto the Steelix now, though, and it hits us with Iron Tail. Our Dynamic Punch misses on turn two, and we get a reset. It looks like Jasmine has been boosting the Iron Tail with secret potion once more. We'd better get onto her case, but not in this run. We're on a very good time with Sneasel and we just want to continue on. Dynamic Punch does what it's supposed to do on this attempt. The Magnemite gets knocked out with a Mud Slap and we are through Jasmine in a time of 41 minutes and 30 seconds. That's not a bad pace at all for Sneasel, but let's keep this momentum going. We're going to go back to Goldenrod City and we're going to say goodbye to Dynamic Punch. It was very much a brief foray with Dynamic Punch, and Headbutt is going to be replacing it once more. Headbutt really is our best normal type move at the moment, because even though Headbutt and Return are roughly equal power by this point in the run, Headbutt has that chance to flinch, and that really is invaluable. Having a 30% chance to just incapacitate your opponent is absolutely fantastic. Of course, we've still got Mudslap on our learn set to take care of that pesky Magnemite line, because we really have nothing better at the moment, and then we're through his Sneasel. That just leaves his Haunter left to go, we're going to waste some of the rest of our Mudslap PP on that to knock it out and we've defeated the rival for the fourth time. And after teaching Return in the Goldenrod Underground just for PP purposes, we rescue the Director. We'll get our rewards, we'll get the Pink Bow from Marie, and that's going to give us a 10% boost to our normal type moves when we're holding it. We'll also grab the Radio Card so that we can make our way through Kanto, and then we'll make our way towards the Ron Seal of Caves. It's the Ice Path. It's called the Ron Seal of Caves because it does exactly what it says on the tin, and while we're in here, we'll get the Waterfall HM and teach that to Psyduck, and we'll also teach Return to Sneeze. On the other side of the cave is Blackthorn City, and that is where our eighth gym leader is waiting for us. This one's Claire, the Dragon-type leader who will lead with Dragonair. We could have used an Ice Punch there, but Return was much better, so we knock it out in one. We don't get the Kingdra into healing range, so it's a two-shot on that, and then it's a one-shot on her final two remaining Dragonair. 
and we really couldn't have asked for a better results for our final gym battle of Johto. And after a little strop in the Dragon's Den, we get her badge in the time of 55 minutes and 54 seconds. Let's now make our way towards the Pokemon League. And the first thing we'll do on our way to the Pokemon League, of course, is pick up the rare candy. And before we take on the rival for the final time, we're going to say goodbye to Headbutt and hello to Shadow Ball. Return is just too powerful to ignore at this point, and Headbutt has served its purpose. But now it's time for the fifth and final rival battle. This time he's leading with his own Sneasel, so it's pointing Spider-Man meme all around, but ours came out on top. He tries with Typhlosion next, and we don't quite one-shot even with the pink bow, but we take very little damage at all from him. He comes out with a Golbat next, and we fling a Ball of Darkness towards it. We get confused for our sins and accidentally hit ourselves in confusion. We knock it out on the next turn though, and here comes Magneton. We've still got Mud Slap on the learn set just for this Magneton and it paid off because we didn't get paralysed. We'll Shadow Ball the Haunter and with that we only have the Kadabra left to go. Kadabra is weak to Shadow Ball as well and we knock it out and that is the rival done and dusted for yet another run. And now that we're in the Pokemon League, we will heal up whether we need it or not, and we'll say thank you to our HM friends. It's a very warm thank you to Kenya, to Abra, to Psyduck, and to Paris. These runs would not be what they are without you, so thank you to all of you. We'll grab our full full restores, which we'll either need or we won't need. And now let's take a look at our stats in big before heading into the League. Now do remember that these stats are just the out of battle stats. We have 147 HP at level 54. We're holding the pink bow with return, hidden power flying, mud slap and shadow ball. 140 in attack, 97 in defense, 76 in special attack, 120 in special defense, and 163 in speed. Those stats will fluctuate as we enter into battle, and our first Elite Four member is Will. He's a psychic type trainer and friend of the channel, and he is leading with a Zatu. Zatu obviously gets one shot by Shadow Ball, and then Executor stands no chance either. His third Pokemon is Jinx, and Jinx has no physical defense, so that goes down in one hit. Here comes the Slowbro. Slowbro gets taken deep into the red and another one knocks it out just to be sure. And his final Pokemon is another Zatu. Zatu quick attacks us for a little bit of damage but we're through Will in a very quick time of 1 hour 2 minutes and 25 seconds. Koga's next to Poison Type Specialist who leads with Ariados. Hidden Power Flying is perfect for these Bug Types because we knock that out in one shot. We do exactly the same against the Venomoth. Here comes the Fortress. Now Fortress is very tanky and very bulky and it uses Explosion. It takes us down to 5 as we critical hit it and we are onto the Muck. We don't one shot the Muck and we go back to the beginning. We're back onto the Ariados and we know that's going to be a one shot with Hidden Power Flying. Exactly the same against the Venomoth. Up next is this pesky fortress. It lays the spikes and we get that same critical hit. It doesn't go boom this time and we are on to Muck. Muck gets taken into the yellow and another one knocks it out just to be sure and his final Pokemon is Crobat. Crobat uses a double team and doesn't heal so we're through Koga in a time of 1 hour 3 minutes and 30 seconds. Now before the next battle we are finally going to say goodbye to Mudslap and hello to Ice Punch. We're going to be utilising our stab for the very first time in this run and it's all because of Bruno's Onyx. Before the Onyx though we get through old spinny legs and old springy legs and then he sends out Hitmonchan. We've got no legs reference for the Hitmonchan because it's all in the arm department but look at how much Muck Punch did. Hidden Power doesn't one shot the Machamp, we take a reset and we're going to need to rely on some luck. There are three things that could go right to get us through that Machamp. We're holding the King's Rock, we could critical hit or cross chop could miss. We just need one of those three things to happen. We're back onto the Machamp now, we give it another go, but it's exactly the same situation. We're now on reset number 6 and we're going to try again. This time Hitmontop uses Detect. That just wastes a turn for us and does nothing else of any importance. Hitmonlee gets out of there and now it's time to take out guaranteed damage from Hitmonchan. We're always going to take a little bit of damage against this Hitmonchan because Mac Punch is a priority move. We hidden power the Machamp and he misses, and that was the luck we needed. Machamp is now in a healing loop because we outspeed, and that brings us to the Onyx. We use Ice Punch against the Onyx because we both have very bad special, and it just turns out that we have Stab on our special. 
Let's now move on to Karen, and it's Dark Type versus Dark Type with Umbreon versus Sneasel. Stand attack misses, and that means we are on full accuracy for the rest of the battle. We don't one shot the Houndour, and that means we take an awful lot of damage from Flamethrower. She gets herself in a healing loop, though, and we knock it out in three hits, and then we get the chance to learn Beat Up. Beat Up's a no no in our runs because it uses the stats from our HM friends. So we're definitely not allowed to use that, because that would be taking from the stats of our HM friends. Her final Pokemon is Vileplume. We knock that out with a single Ice Punch, and we are through Karen and through the main parts of the league in 1 hour, 7 minutes and 28 seconds. All that's left between us and the Hall of Fame is Lance the Liar with the Flyers. He leads, of course, with Gyarados. Gyarados rarely attacks on turn 1, and this is no different, so that means that Gyarados is a free KO. The rain is also set up, which means that Charizard's flamethrower does next to nothing, and we are still in the green for the Aerodactyl. We have Ice Punch for the Aerodactyl, and even with Stab, we don't knock it out. That means we are on 16 HP, growing to 20 for the rest of the battle. Lance sends out his highest level Dragon Ice, it's a one shot, and that means that this is a foregone conclusion. All of his other Pokemon are going to get knocked out in one single hit, and we defeat Lance on 20 HP in a time of 1 hour, 8 minutes and 21 seconds. And let's get our league time, it is 1 hour, 8 minutes and 38 seconds. That's the first part of the run done, but there's still lots more to come, so don't you dare go anywhere, Kanto is next. And we're back where it began outside our home in New Bark Town. And would you believe Professor Elm has something for us? He's got the SS tickets and we're going to be taking a trip on a boat all the way over to Kanto. Before we get there though, we're going to say welcome back to our HM friends. Kenya Abra, Cider, and Paris had a lovely rest in the league. And they are cheering Sneasel on for the rest of this run. And now we only have a couple of bits left to do in Johto. We're going to grab the rare candy from inside Mount Mortar, and then we're going to take a trip towards Violet City. We didn't pick up Flash in the early parts of the game because taking on Sprout Tower there would have been incredibly slow, so we're going to grab that now along with the rare candy in Violet City. Flash, of course, is a breeze at this point in the game, and we don't get the 10-second cutscene with the rival. Our final rare candy is in the Whirl Islands, and with all of those things done, we are finished with Johto until it's time to take on Red. But for now though, we're going to take a hop, skip and a jump over the open sea on the boat and end up in Vermilion City. And the first thing we do in Kanto is the last thing we do in Johto. We're going to pick up a rare candy, this time from the chairman of the Pokemon fan club. Once we've got that safely tucked away with all the rest of our rare candies, we can make our way into Celadon City. There are a couple of bits we need to pick up here in Celadon City. We're going to grab the leftovers to give Sneasel something to munch on mid-battle, and we're going to get the PP up from the bush. And now it's time to take on our Gym Leader Gauntlet. We are going to show every single Gym Leader in Kanto, as we have done in every single one of our runs in the past. Now recently there has been some criticism levelled at people who show every single gym battle in Kanto. There are a couple of reasons why I show every single battle in Kanto, and why that's never going to change. Firstly, I know a lot of you enjoy playing these runs along with me, so I like to show what went right, what went wrong, what I could have done better, and what huge strokes of luck we had to get through each and every gym leader. And also, we need all 16 gym badges in order to battle Red. And considering I really enjoy the completion aspect of these runs, I'm not going to arbitrarily lop off a gym leader because their battle was easy. There is absolutely no clear-cut line between an easy gym battle and a difficult gym battle, so I don't want to arbitrarily create rules for myself saying I'll show this battle just because it's in Johto, even though it was four one-shots with something like Return, when on the other hand we have a similar battle in Kanto and that will get lopped off. And of course, you can always just skip through to the red battle. I really don't mind, as long as you're having fun and you get what you want out of my content. And the very last thing I'll say about this is it doesn't matter how anybody else does their runs. Everybody has a unique way of approaching these challenge runs. And the beauty of a challenge run is there is no right or wrong way to play it. As long as you're having fun or at least having an interesting time doing it, then you're doing it right. 
and I will always be supportive of anybody who wants to get into challenge running. It's brought me an awful lot of pleasure over the last 12 months or so, and I really want to spread that love and spread that happiness with as many people who want to try it as possible. But now let's shift our focus back towards the gym battles. We defeated Erica in a time of 1.14.49, Misty in 1.20.02, and Sabrina in 1.20.39, and we have just taken a reset against Lieutenant Surge. That pesky Magneton Zap Cannon does, and we stood no chance of getting through the rest of the battle. Unfortunately, we have nothing great against the Steel type, but thank goodness this is our final Steel type of the run. We got through unscathed this time, and then the rest of the battle is trivial. We one shot the Electrode, we one shot the Electabuzz, and we get Surge's badge in a time of 1.22.36. Let's now move on to Brock. Brock, of course, is a rock type leader, so he has a type advantage over us. But we have Ice Punch for three of his Pokemon, and we have Blind Faith for the other two. We get through the Graveler with no problem, and it's three shots on the Omastar. He sends out Onyx next, and that's a very nice Ice Punch, and then he'll send out Kabutops. Kabutops, of course, being the other Rock Water Pokemon on his team. This time it's a two shot because Kabutops is much less bulky. He rounds things off with a Rhyhorn. We knock that out with Ice Punch, and we've completed the first part of our Gym Leader Gauntlet in a time of 1 hour 23 minutes and 51. One seconds. Let's now take a trip down through Viridian Hedgemaze, saying hello to Three Drill en route, and we'll make our way to Cinnabar Island. At Cinnabar Island, we chat with Blue, and that activates his gym battle for us to go back to when we're back in Viridian City. We've got a rare candy here on Cinnabar Island as well, and our next destination, of course, is going to be the Seafoam Islands, where Blaine has relocated. It's another gym where we technically have the type disadvantage, so let's see how it goes. He leads with Makargo, and Makargo hits us with a relatively weak flamethrower. We use a Shadow Ball to knock it out in two hits, and we're on to the Bumhead Fire Duck. The Bumhead Fire Duck gets knocked out in one shot, and our great speed works to our advantage. Because we outspeed the Rapid Ash, we knock it out in one shot, and we get Blaine's badge in the time of 125.22. And now we're on to our penultimate gym leader, and this is Janine. Janine is an absolute pushover, and she is arguably the least important of all the gym battles we do. We save her till last because it provides a huge contrast between her and the first really difficult gym battle we have had since Jasmine. We knock out all of her Pokemon in a single hit, and we get her badge in a time of 1 hour 26 minutes and 6 seconds. Let's now move on to Blue. He is arguably the hardest of the gym leaders, and he leads with Pidgeot. Now, we could have used Ice Punch against this Pidgeot, however, Return is doing a lot more damage. Just look at the sheer difference between our physical and special attacks here. We get hit by a nasty pair of flamethrowers from the Arcanine, though, and we're gonna have to take a reset. We use Return twice against the Pidgeot again, and we're back onto the Arcanine. Return takes Arcanine into the yellow as it flinches with the King's Rock, and we're onto the Rhydon. Rhydon has very little special, as I learned in a recent recording session, so keep your eye out for that, and it got knocked out with a single Ice Punch. We don't have anything too great against the Gyarados, but a pair of Returns easily takes care of it, and we're onto Executor. We get Executor into a healing loop, however it does manage to leech seed us. It makes no difference to the outcome of the battle though, because we knock it out in a second Shadow Ball, and his final Pokemon is Alakazam. Alakazam gets knocked out with a single Shadow Ball to get the Earth Badge in a time of 1 hour 28 minutes and 33 seconds. And that's it, we've got all 16 Gym Badges. Our journey is nearly at a close. We are under 90 minutes for getting all the Gym Badges so far, and there was a time in the not-too-distant past where this would have made Sneasel a contender for top spot. Our runs have just been getting quicker and quicker, so where do you think Sneasel is going to end up? Let me know down in the comments below as I tell you that this is Red. He is our final challenge of the run, and he leads with Pikachu. We of course use Return against the Pikachu, and it's a one-shot, so we knock it out. Pikachu is irrelevant for the rest of the run. However, this Charizard is not. A single flamethrower knocks us out, so we're going to have to use Rare Candy straight away. We have absolutely no chance of knocking out the Snorlax in one or two hits, so we're going to have to go even higher with our levels. We're now at level 69, and it turns out the return was a damage range this entire time. We knock it out in two shots, though, and we're back onto Charizard. We get an excellent bit of luck here as we critical hit the Charizard and flinch it to make sure we take it out with no damage whatsoever, and we're onto the Snorlax. Snorlax flinches, and we take it down into the yellow. 
We take it deep into the red, but Body Slam critical hits us and knocks us out. The game giveth and the game taketh away. Our best plan here is to flinch. So we're going to get rid of Hidden Power Flying and we're going to go for Headbutt. Our best chance of getting through this battle quickly is with Stasis Conditions. More specifically, we want to freeze and we want to flinch. We've got the freeze chance with Ice Punch and the flinch chance is coming from Headbutt. The King's Rock just is not cutting the mustard. We're going to grow to level 76 and try again. Of course, the Pikachu is now definitely a one-shot and we get the freeze off on the Charizard. The Charizard goes down without us taking any damage whatsoever, and we're back onto the Snorlax. We Ice Punch it, but we don't get the Freeze, so we're going to swap to Headbutt to try and flinch it instead. He Body Slams us though, and he paralyzes us. In my absolute desperation to make sure that Sneasel has a respectable time, we try the Curse Strat. I want to see if just one speed drop is enough for us to outspeed the important Pokemon, and I got a very quick answer, no. So let's now try again, this time without using Curse on the first few Pokemon. We get rid of the Pikachu in one shot, we're going for the Freeze on the Charizard. We get it this time and then we use Return. It's three returns to knock it out and we are onto the Snorlax. Snorlax is highly likely to use Amnesia on turn one and that gives us a chance to start swearing. We set up just a single Curse. We still have a very high speed but now our attack is at 337 in battle. That gives us an opportunity to two-shot the Snorlax, and then we two-shot the Venusaur. That brings us on to the Blastoise. We use Return on turn one to take it into the yellow. He starts a rain dance, so he doesn't attack us, and that means we knock it out on turn two. His final Pokemon is Espeon. Super effective Shadow Ball takes it deep into the red. Another one knocks it out, and we have our final time of 1 hour, 38 minutes, and 36 seconds. Considering our special attack is very, very lackluster, and we were relying just on physical moves throughout this entire run, I think that 1.38.36 is an incredibly respectable time for Sneasel. And that puts us in 14th place on the leaderboard. We're in some very nice company here, in between Domfan and Miltank. Of course, now all the way down in 44th place, we have Mercargo. And while we're here, let's spare a thought for Noctowl. It only got one video on the front page before Quillfish usurped it last time. But let's now take a look at the front page and see that there is absolutely no change to the podium. It's still Kangaskhan in first place, Charizard in second place, and Blastoise in third place. But with that, we are done. So I'm going to say thank you all so much for watching, and thank you especially for bearing with me through my little ramble. If you've enjoyed this video, please do leave it a like. If you want to see more content just like this, then consider subscribing. I have a Patreon at patreon.com slash trainersquidgy. And until next time, I'll say thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you all very, very soon.